Hello Biology 230, this is Dr. Griffin, and this is video number two for module nine. Remember there are five total videos that you need to look at and learn from for module nine, and this is the second one. So last time I did a brief introduction to Mendelian genetics and then discussed alleles and contrasted traits from characters. And remember we used this example of what Mendel did was mainly working with plants. And here's an example of looking at flower color. And we talked about the this flower that had purple flowers had different set of alleles than the other flowers, the other plants that had white flowers. Well notice that in the F1 generation, all the plants had purple flowers. And so therefore we would state that the allele that is responsible for expressing purple flowers is dominant to the allele for white flowers. And so if we look at the phenotypes, which is just the outward expression of the genes, we would say that the purple phenotype is dominant to the white phenotype. And dominant means is that the allele is going to mask the expression of the other recessive alleles. So if you look at the genotypes, which is just the genetic composition of the, the two plants here, let's say we represent each allele for each plant um, being a capital P or capital P, which means it has two dominant alleles for flower color. So if you have two dominant alleles for flower color, you have purple flowers. And we cross this, and again, this is this hybridization process with a plant that has two recessive alleles. So we represent recessive alleles with lowercase letters. So if we cross two alleles or a plant with two dominant alleles with a plant that has two recessive alleles, what we will get, and you can work this out using the Punnett square, uh, which is discussed at length in your textbook in Campbell, all your, animal, all your plants here, let me get my arrow, here will be heterozygous, which means it has one dominant allele and one recessive allele. And here you can definitely see that the allele for purple flowers is masking or is dominant to the allele for white flowers because none of the F1 generation or the hybrids, hybrids meaning that they are heterozygous, have white flowers, they all have purple flowers. So purple is dominant to white. Hope that all makes sense. We can go through it again. Cross one purple plant with a white plant. And if all the purple, the plants have purple flowers, then we would say that that trait um, is dominant to the other trait. So purple is dominant to white. And this set or this allele here for purple flowers is dominant to the allele for white flowers. So the only way to get the expression of white, which is a recessive trait, is that you must have two recessive alleles. So if you have two of the same type of alleles, that is referred to as homozygous. So the genotype would be homozygous dominant for the purple flowers or homozygous recessive for the white flowers. And the genotype for the F1 generation would be heterozygous. Now here's a tip. If an organism is true breeding, so in a problem or a discussion issue, if they note that the organism is true breeding, that means that its genotype must be homozygous. And you can work that out on your own to see why that is true. Two different genotypes can lead to the same phenotype. So again, all the F1s uh, were heterozygous, meaning they had one dominant and one recessive alleles, allele. If you cross them amongst themselves or with each other, so you can self or cross pollinate these plants that have purple flowers now, what you will see is that you'll get mostly, again, these purple flowered plants, but you'll also get a set of white flowered plants. So why do you get more purple flowered plants than white flowered plants? Well, again, I would implore for, implore you to use the Punnett square and what you will see is that you'll get three different types of genotypes three different types of genetic compositions or allele compositions 
you have some with the genotype of dominant P, dominant P, or homozygous dominant. You have another set, here's my arrow, that have the dominant allele and a recessive allele, which means that it is heterozygous. Both of these plant types or set of plants that have these genotypes, two different genotypes now, will have the same phenotype because this dominant allele masks or covers up the expression of the recessive allele. So both of these will be purple. And you have another set here that has two sets of recessive alleles, or it's homozygous recessive, and all these plants would be, let me draw white, draw the, my invisible line from the white flower to the homozygous recessive genotype condition, or genotypic condition. Here's an example of a Punnett square for a dihybrid cross, which means you're crossing two individuals that are heterozygous for two different characters, two different genes, okay? And you can see here that this Punnett square doesn't have the four squares in it, it has 16. And a Punnett square can easily predict the phenotypic and genotypic ratios for one to two characters slash genes. So we can use the Punnett square when we're only talking about one gene or maybe two genes. However, when you go and start looking at three or more genes, Punnett squares become very lengthy, very large, and very cumbersome. It would take a lot of time, so it would not be ideal to try to use a Punnett square for more than two genes on a test. Now, next video, I'll talk about how to use rules of statistics, or specifically rules of probability, to determine genotypic and phenotypic ratios. That's it for today's video. Um, again, this is video two out of five for module nine associated with chapter 14 in your Campbell textbook for Biology 230. This is Dr. Griffin signing off. And remember, don't forget to view and learn from the next set of videos.